a unit that epitomized the dogged tenacity of Western men within the Eastern Army is the brigade composed originally of the 2nd, 6th, 7th Wisconsin, and the 19th Indiana Infantry. The men, who would soon form the Iron Brigade, attached their identity to their taller black army hats, the model 1858 army hat known as the Hardy. The man who brought that hat and the pre-war regular army uniform of a long frock coat to the volunteer Westerners was Brigadier General John Gibbon, a former instructor at West Point and a soldier who literally wrote the manual on how to be a soldier. Gibbon trained and expected the men to adhere to his rigid regular army standards and the Iron Brigade proved themselves equal to any regular army organization. The first example of their iron will is the Battle of Brauner Farm during the Second Bull Run Campaign. On that hot August day in 1862, these men advanced up a slope and engaged a division of Stonewall Jackson's command on their own. The Westerners held their ground for an hour until the sun set and the battling slowed. This established their iron-strong identity at the loss of 900 men. The next month, at the Battle of South Mountain, the command advanced again up the side of Turner's Gap and did exactly what they had done at Brauner Farm, closing closer on the rebels. Admiring generals watching the attack made reference to the prowess of the men, perhaps using the descriptive word iron, and some would call them the Iron Brigade from that day on. The Confederates called them the Black Hat Brigade. On July 1st, 1863, at the Battle of Gettysburg, the 24th Michigan would seal themselves with the Iron Brigade with both blood and iron. The brigade was rushed to the western suburbs of Gettysburg in order to hold their ground against the advance of three separate Confederate brigades. The brigade's black hats were much weathered and lacked some of the martial air they had when issued, but all on the field could make no mistake what troops stood at the forefront of the Army's 1st Corps defensive line, the 24th Michigan holding the center. The 1,400 Iron Brigade men were hit by 3,200 veteran Confederates, including the 26th North Carolina. The fight was a slugfest, a slow, bloody, point-blank retreat. The cost at Gettysburg was clear. Almost 1,200 men were left on the field. The 24th Michigan earned the respect of their Western comrades with the highest casualties of the brigade, 400 of their proximate 500 lost. The Iron Brigade would continue to fight with the Army of the Potomac, but it was never the same organization after Gettysburg. No replacements could replicate the original core of those brave 61 and 62 volunteers. Outside of combat, the life of the common soldier of the Army of the Potomac was like that of soldiers throughout history, marching, drilling, guard duty, and camp. The men mastered firemaking for the two most important needs of a soldier, cooking and warmth, and burning pilfered fence rails, the best type of instant dried firewood. With the issue and cooking of the rations, coffee became a daily ritual. Coffee was one of the few joys the soldier could find, and usually adding sugar satisfied the sweet tooth. Coffee boiling could be done in minutes, but the effect of caffeine on the body, a daily necessary drug. The cooking of the other staple rations could also be performed quickly if needed on campaign quickly frying the issue salted pork, boiling coffee, and munching their cracker-like hardtack would be what the Army wanted for its soldiers, quick prep, sustainable meals.
Sometimes, just like the rebels after a battle, federal soldiers would pilfer dead Confederates' haversacks and look for things that they received more commonly than in the North, specifically tobacco and cornmeal. If camped near a farm or homestead, foraging for extra food also became commonplace, even if discouraged by officers. Federal soldiers would mix cornmeal with water, some foraged eggs, and bacon grease, resulting in a johnny cake, or fried cornbread that could be stowed into the haversack. When in more permanent or winter camps, the men would receive additional rations, like bread, flour, potatoes, onions, beans, and rice. If Billy Yank was really living good in camp, an army sutler might hang his shingle nearby where canned peaches and tomatoes, or candy and other treats, would force a soldier to part with his $13 a month pay. The men would become experts at one form of cooking or another and typically combine their foods and cooking implements into ad hoc groups of four to seven men called a mess. Several messes made up a company and the commissary officers would ensure the correct weight and distribution of rations. The canteen, the constant companion of a soldier, was his faucet if a spring, well, or stream were not found. Keeping the men with water could sometimes be more problematic than issuing rations. <laughs> <laughs> 